your leave, I rise to make a statement with respect to my ministries and to update the country. Let me start, Madam Speaker, by saying that my heart and condolences, of course, all condolences go out to those who have lost persons to crime and violence recently. As you know, Madam Speaker, I've been in politics for about a decade. My first time in Parliament, and I never, ever sought to make crime and violence a political issue. And the reason for that is because I'm a medical doctor. And I understand the underlying causes of these things. And these issues are national issues and should be treated as such. I learned something this morning that the pastor who prayed for us, Pastor Evening, informed me that Koji was his son. And so I want all of us really convey our condolences to Pastor Evelyn. A lot of us did not do that. That is why I want to call on the people of St. Kitts and Nevis that we should work together to make sure that we deal with this scourge once and for all. We must know, and we have been given the information for decades now, that this is an issue in the Caribbean that has to be dealt with from its root. I went to a symposium as the minister of, as the prime minister, and also as the minister of national security in Trinidad, where we sought to look at crime and violence from a public health perspective. It is a broad concept, but it is a concept that has been well studied scientifically and will deliver results. As I speak, my advisor, Dr. Patrick Martin would have met with the press to further explain what this is. And the task force has been put together for us to deal with it. An aspect of it is an all society approach. But this time, we will apply a scientific approach to it so that we can achieve what we want to achieve. Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, apart from that, the Ministry of National Security has been doing a number of critical things, including support from regional and international partners, and that has resulted in some very positive developments. No resource will be held back from this ministry to ensure that the people of St. Vincent and Nevis are safe, including our visitors when they come. That is why I call on the young people to choose better ways we have a number of critical good options for our people in the orange economy, in the arts. You can become a technician. You can go to university. You can go to college. Your college is free. Many scholarships to go to university. Opportunities to get into farming, agriculture. Here in St. Kitts and Nevis, when people come here to visit, they say, at all these opportunities, why are we taking full advantage of them? And so I want to encourage our young people, Madam Speaker, to do such. But in that vein, let me add, Madam Speaker, that while the Ministry of National Security is working with regional and international partners and doing a number of critical things to make sure that we protect our people, and we have, and I mentioned also that we have put a task force in place, which I think is possibly the first task force in the Caribbean. I have seen this data over the years, and I would not allow this term to pass, even this year to pass, without giving St. Kitts and Nevis a scientific approach to deal with this issue. This type of program was introduced in Central America and South America with tremendous, tremendous positive results. The Caribbean delayed in implementing this, delayed in implementing this. And that is why Dr. Isabel Williams, in his keynote address to the symposium, a petition said for decades he has been bringing this forward, not only at the regional level, and because of that delay, the Caribbean is having a delay as well in its resolution. But we will move very swiftly, quickly, fervently to make sure that we do what we have to do here in St. Kitts and Nevis and create, if we have to, a model for our brothers and sisters within the Caribbean 
to fall. So I'm very optimistic because in our hand, we have a scientific approach to deal with this. But at the same time, we want to also alert our people that the Alternative Lifestyle Program has been assessed over the last months by a professional. The report has been put forward and the recommendations for that program to transform it, not only transform it, but replace it with a sustainable program that really benefits those who are a part of the program. As we know and we heard from the ACP when he spoke at the press conference, that the program had become very corrupted and benefited not those who were on the program, but a lot of those, but those who may have been involved in the management of the program, not all of them, but we know that it had become monetized and corrupted. And so we cannot continue along that path, Madam Speaker. We have calculated a roughly over $100 million already spent on the program in a corrupted way. In time, we will reveal where that money went and the money trail for it. And most of it did not benefit those who were on the program. So I want to say that we have been doing that and we will bring that forward to the people of St. Vincent and Davis. Madam Speaker, I want to also, Deputy Speaker, I want to update the country and a couple other and a number of critical areas very quickly. The issue of undocumented or persons who came here accidentally, I would say. For example, those the Africans and the Haitians. As you know, the Haitians were picked up here in March. I think it was the second of March, where 14 persons were um, rescued from a boat that was drifting. On that boat were two minors and a pregnant woman. We had been working um, closely with others to determine what would happen. As you know, the policy was then that persons who landed, they would be sent back to their country. Interestingly enough, in this one, this last one, they were coming from Dominica and heading to another country where their boat um, engine uh, failed and they were rescued by our Coast Guard and so they were brought here. They never intended at that point to come to St. Vincent and Davis. But the laws of St. Vincent and Davis had to be applied. That And so those who were involved in human trafficking, they were charged, and I know that they are in prison, I don't know if they are convicted as yet. They have been convicted and they are serving time in prison. But for those who were the passengers, they were housed at the St. Johnson Community Center under the you know, humane conditions. And so after time and time, I have been in communication, Madam Speaker, speaking with the Haitian president each time we were at heads of government. The last heads of government which I was at, which was the Hamas, he said to me, PM, things are very, very, things have gotten worse. So between March and now, the conditions in Haiti have gotten significantly worse for the people of Haiti. And so we had to make a decision. And so I want to also say that our people need to have the opportunity to discuss what will be our actions when it comes to these type of situations going forward. But we know when we start to take action in March, an injunction was placed on that. And so we could not continue with the normal course of action of getting them back to their home. And so that case was pending. But having that information from the President of Haiti, having that information from the Prime Minister of Jamaica, who would report one of the point persons, and having that information from the Prime Minister of Bahamas, who would also report. Also hearing from the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, we know that the situation and CARICOM would have been doing its own assessment is very, very dire. And so the question becomes, what should we do with our Haitian brothers and sisters? Why? There are children who should be in school. Questions to be asked. Should we keep children out of school? There's a pregnant woman who should not be allowed to be given the best opportunity to be pregnant. And those who are there in a homeland that is in the condition that is in, what should we do? And so we have taken the decision after all this time looking at the situation has gotten extremely worse to discuss with the Haitian community 
that is here to create a situation where they can have them while all of the review are taking place. Make sure, from a national security standpoint, that these persons were persons who were threat based on records and so forth um, um, to say this and this. The other one, of course, Madam Speaker, is the one with the Africans. Since they landed on the 28th of March, we sought to involve the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. I don't think we have ever faced a situation like this in our history, Madam Speaker. Some Africans, or African brothers and sisters, came over on a flight to Antigua, and when they got there, I think they expressed that they did not want to leave. They had expressed that they came from Cameroon, where there might have been a civil war, and that their, life, their lives were threatened. And so they took to the high seas with smugglers again. And then moving across the high seas to go to another territory, not intending to come to St. Kitts and Nevis, their boat capsized. Many died. Three bodies were retained and 14 survivors. When they came, we quickly um, reached out to the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees and so forth to see how we should manage this as a country. Madam Speaker, as you know, we are signed on to a number of critical um, treaties and norms and so forth that are practiced. We are a member of the United Nations. And so they guided us through the process. And this process has been going on since March, maybe early April, and the United Nations would have conducted very intense um, type of um, approach where they interviewed each one of them, did a, an assessment to advise us on what next to do. Last Friday, the United Nations reached the point where they said that they, we should consider granting asylum seeker status until they would have resolved their matter completely. And so we have complied, Madam Speaker, with that. And the United Nations High Commission for Refugees is continuing a third round of interviews to make sure that they complete the process of determining their ultimate destination. We, on the weekend, I had to call the local UN representative here, the regional representative, and we also reach out to the representative, I think it was in Washington, who was acting on the matter. And so we also brought in the Red Cross so that we make sure as far as possible we respect their human rights. And so after granting that, it was decided that they should move to another location after they would have advised us and done all their um, interviews <coughs> back home and so forth to make sure that St. and Davis was not putting itself at risk. And so we have done that and they have moved from the St. Peter's Community Center to another location. And we continue to work with the United Nations to determine the ultimate um, destination. And so I wanted to update the country on these very important national security or immigration issues, one of which I don't think we have ever faced before. But I'm happy to say that we managed the best, we could do the best um, advice from the United Nations and of course involving every ministries and the Red Cross to make sure. I can say that all of the persons in our care, all are safe, all are um, basically in uh, fairly um, good health, whether it be our the Haitians or whether it be those from um, Cameroon. So Madam Speaker, I thought it was very, very important that I update the country with respect to that particular matter. I also want to say that the Canadian partial um, visa free access came in just recently. I think that this of course gives our people uh, an option to travel to Canada without having to apply. It would affect about 25% of our population. Um, when I spoke to the corresponding ministry in Canada, that is the information that they would have provided to me. I would like to say um, to 
um, efforts pass to get this done. And to Prime Minister Trudeau and his administration for taking really a progressive step when it comes to travel. I had the opportunity to discuss with the President. I met him at the United Nations at a meeting that was about the Haitians and ET situation. He has taken a particular yeah, the Prime Minister. I met the Prime Minister right in at the United Nations um, at a meeting that was discussing the issue of Haiti. There also was the President of Haiti. If you look, there was a picture with me greeting President Trudeau and the uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and the President of Haiti right there looking on. And I subsequently had the opportunity again to meet him in Bahamas in February um, for the heads of government for CARICOM meeting. And at that meeting, um, we had, I asked to meet with him, and he and I met for lunch, uh, at lunch time. And we had an extensive <coughs> conversation, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this was the focus of our, our conversation. And in that conversation, he said, Terence, you know, we are really seeking to do some, some, some changes with respect to that, after a careful analysis and so forth would have been done, and that some changes would come, and I said, you know, with these positive changes, I think St. Vincent Davis is a country that you know, uh, is in a position to have, uh, you know, freeze up the access as we had before. And I hope St. Vincent Davis is being considered uh, with the new changes that will come. And he said to me, not very, he didn't say in certain terms, he said, I will see, I, I think St. Vincent Davis might be there. But they, they said, you know, very open. So we had a good conversation. You know, he's a very prudent person. He's very careful in what he said, or very responsible, to put it that way. And so, it was good news when I was called, when I was asked that the very corresponding ministry in Canada wanted to have a conversation with, him with respect to immigration. And as I went into the meeting, they delivered the news too. And so, I would quickly went back to the Prime Minister Trudeau and the people of Canada thanking them for this initial step of establishing um, our uh, visa free access um, to, to Canada, which I know is a very prudent and carefully um, sought out policy from the Canadians as we expect always a very high um, level of performance by that, by that country. And so I'm happy that this is the, this is the result and to thank all those would have been involved in this as well, um, you know, from the Ministry of Family Affairs, President Lee, and previous, and those who are the high commissions in Canada, um, from, you know, from time, um, then till now. I'm happy that we have reached this point, um, Madam Speaker. Um, I also want to say, Madam Speaker, and I want to condemn very, very strongly that fake advisory that went out against our country. That is an attack, not on me or our administration. That is an attack on the people of St. Kitts and Davis. This fake advisory that somehow something to do with security and so forth. I want to say and to condemn strongly that those who are doing this, they are not the friends of St. Kitts and Davis. That they don't like St. Kitts and Davis. That they don't want to see us do well. We listened carefully this morning from the Minister of Tourism and said it's a Nevis is doing extremely well. We heard about the flight from London, um, from, from London coming to St. Kitts, with more people coming to St. Kitts than even Antigua in the last numbers that were sent. We heard that we did not have to use the MRG for any of the destinations because the demand to get to St. Kitts is so high. St. Kitts is a beloved place, a sought after place. Of course, I'm gonna to come to that. St. Kitts is a place, right? And that is, what they are seeking, uh, that is what they are seeking to do. So when they attack our country, they are attacking all of us. Because when people um, come at um, our international airport, a lot of them take the boat and they go over to Nevis as well. They enjoy the two islands as one destination. I want to condemn it. And all of us in St. Kitts and Nevis, we need to condemn it and condemn it very, very strongly, Madam Speaker. But I want to thank the Minister 
for the trips that she has been making. These trips are responsible for what we are seeing. You can't stay vast here and sit down and expect things to come and tours to come. As a minister of tourism, you have to tourism, you have to go to the destination and bring the planes, bring the boats, and bring the people to our destination here in St. Kitts and Nevis. So I want to update the country on that. I want to quickly say that this Baham, I was in Bahamas recently where we met with the Vice President and we had fruitful discussions there. And one of the things that came out, of course, was the issue of crime and violence in the region and all of the additional resources that will come. There are significant resources that have started to work. The Caribbean must not be a safe haven for those who want to be in criminal activities. We must work together and do all that we can to make sure that we are the safest place um, here in the Western Hemisphere. And we can achieve that, Madam Speaker. And so I am happy that I traveled to Bahamas, was able to be in those discussions with the, with the Vice President. And when it was my time to speak, number one thing on my agenda was the issue of security and so forth. And the matter of health, very quickly, we are exploring renal transplant program. The transplant surgeon was here just last week, and we are pushing forward to see if we can implement a full renal transplant program. The reason why we are pushing this, a lot of young people are actually um, patients of renal disease on dialysis, and we have to seek a way to help them. So we are pushing on that, and we offer this service to the rest of the OECS. We are moving on our sickle cell program. This program will offer to the rest of the Caribbean. We are seeking to partner with the German and the University of Hamburg to cure sickle cell disease, not to just treat it, but to cure it. And I know that the specialists will be here saying it soon um, to, to, um, to do the initial um, assessment to see when that program can be um, done. And lastly, let me say that the OECS Authority will be here in St. Kitts and Nevis. I'll have the opportunity for the year to be the chair. It starts on the 17th to the 18th, where the OECS will participate in high-level discussions um, going forward. Um, I also want to say that there will be a walk Saturday morning at 6 a.m., um, which will start at the movies all the way to the Philippe Lawn. And to add also, Madam Speaker, that a number of critical um, infrastructure development, in, infrastructure developments are coming. These are the Connery Field, the St. Peter's um, Road, the St. Peter's Health Center, um, and we spoke about the drilling that is taking place over in KR, and also to talk about the housing for the MRI. So we're going to see these start this year, definitely, Madam Speaker, and to say <coughs> that we intend also to start our new, brand new smart hospital this year um, as well. So, Madam Speaker, with your leave, thank you.